Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown up there on the prairie. Beautiful fall days, those high blue skies, birds flying in flocks high up against the clouds and fields of hay and soybeans out waiting for the mowers and farmers out cutting corn, filling up their silos and the trees turning gold and red out in the woods, colors that we never had in our Crayola boxes ever. Gorgeous, gorgeous colors. That magnificent oak tree that stands in the back of Lyle Jansky's yard was just starting to turn red this last week when the tree trimmers came to take off a dead branch and discovered there was much more wrong with it and they went down to school to find him, to tell him where he was teaching his 10th grade biology class. He was showing them slides of sand cranes, those beautiful birds that look like ballet dancers in costume. And some of the comedians in the back of the class were making sounds, ah, ooh, oh, oh, which were much more interesting to the class than anything on the screen or anything that Lyle had to say. He was called out of the room, and there in the hall were two men in yellow, helmets and safety belts, and they said, that oak tree of yours is going to have to come down, and we wanted to come over and tell you. We thought you'd want to know. Well, thank you, he said. I appreciate that. He could hear back in the classroom children going, oh, <laughs> Yeah, one of the guys said, I know if it were my tree. I would want to know. It's a magnificent tree, the other man said. It must be 60, 70 years old. In fact, it was 75 years old. Lyle found when he got home as best he could count the rings. The stump was just about a foot and a half off the ground. All of this magnificent tree, except for the skinny branches that they'd hauled away, lay in three-foot sections around the backyard. Great bare sky overhead that he wasn't used to looking at. Magnificent tree gone, lying there. He went in the house, he changed into his old clothes. He came back out, he got a pair of gloves out of the garage and a maul and he started to split the wood. It was good work. It felt good after being cooped up all day with children who weren't listening to anything he said. He started to split the wood, and it split very well. You didn't have to whack it with brute force, like some guy trying to ding the bell in a carnival. You just had to strike with authority, and the wood flew apart. He'd split what looked to be almost a cord after about an hour or so. And then he saw his wife Janice pull up in front of the house in the car and get out and come down the walk towards him. And he thought to himself, if you walk up to me and tell me to be careful not to hit my foot, I'm out of here. <laughs> Don't you say it. Don't you think of it. She walked up and she said, what in the world have you done? What happened to the tree? He explained to her what had happened to it. She said, still as if it were his fault, she said, you didn't ask for a second opinion from a tree surgeon? <laughs> no, he says, carpenter ants, look at that. They got in it and they ate the core right out of it, through about two-thirds of it. She said, well, you don't know about trees. Well, I teach biology, he said. <laughs> oh, pff, she said. <laughs> she started to go to the house and then she turned and she said, you better be careful or you're going to hit your foot with that and break it. <laughs> So, he dropped the mall right there on the ground. He walked out the back gate and down the alley, and he turned right, and he walked two blocks downtown, and he walked into the sidetrack tap. <laughs> and he walked up to the bar, and he said, give me a beer and a bump, Wally, thanks. Clint was sitting there. Clint Bunsen was sitting 
at the bar. He said, so what's going on with you, Lyle? Lyle told him all about it. Well, Clint said, you did the right thing. You got to just walk away from it sometimes. You can only argue so long. And a uh, woman uh, doesn't respect a man who doesn't have his limits. You'll see. Yeah, Wally said, that's exactly the right thing. You did the right thing. He said, sure. She'll get over it. Lyle didn't think that Janice would ever get over it. She's been like this for years. The rolled eyes, always rolling her eyes, always sighing. Everything that he says, everything that he does. She goes, oh boy, oh boy. As if he had no brains at all. What does that say? If he's so dumb, what does that say about his wanting to marry her in the first place? <laughs> so, you're selling many cards, Clint, he said to Clint. No, Clint said, I don't have any time to. I'm trying to take care of my mother. Mother's 92 years old. She lives down in this little town outside of Phoenix called Paradise Valley. She lives alone, 92. She's doing pretty well until... Last year, she broke her hip, but didn't quite heal right. She had to use a walker, and her cataracts got bad. And my daughter just dropped in to visit her once, and she found Grandma lying on the couch, a little confused, and surrounded by old newspapers and empty tuna fish cans that she'd been eating out of, and she didn't seem to have bathed for about a month. So she called me, and I flew down the next day, and I rang the doorbell, and my mother answered the door, and she was all dolled up. She was all dolled up. She said, why, hello, what a surprise, she said. And she led me into her house. And I could tell that she couldn't see where she was going. But she managed to make it look as if she could. She had it all memorized, where everything was. Won't you come in and have coffee, she said. And even though she couldn't see a thing, she managed to get the coffee off of the stove and to set the cups out on the table and the sugar and the cream and sit down and look at me, not in the eyes. She looked me in the forehead and <laughs> she said, how wonderful to see you. Well, you have to admire somebody who's willing to work so hard to put on an act like that. I left her the next day and I said, Mother, please, if you need help, just please call us. Will you promise to do that? Please. Yeah, Lyle said. I tell you, when old people start to go to pieces, it just all goes at once. It's like that tree of mine. <laughs> Seventy-five years old and a limb must have blown off years ago in a windstorm, and it left a hole in the side of the tree, and squirrels dug in and made a nest in it, and the carpenter ants came in through that hole, and they ate out the whole bore of the tree. So it didn't have any structural solidity, and then an ice storm, wind storm, something, cracked, the hole cracked down about 16 feet, running down the side of the tree. Had to take the whole, whole thing out. Then Raleigh Hockstetter walked in through the door, sat down at the bar. Give me a beer and a bump, he said, and bring one for my friends here. Wally served him up, brought out a bottle of Jim Beam, poured three shot gas glasses, poured glasses of beer, said him out. Well, Raleigh said, I finally done it. I finally went and did it. I sold my herd. As of a week from Wednesday, I'm out of dairy farming. Well, congratulations, they said. Retirement. You've made it at last. Yeah, I said, 1945, I started out. I don't know if you knew that, but I've been going at it that long. 1945. I was reading somewhere where there were 150,000 dairy farms in Minnesota when I started out. 90% of them have gone now. There's only about 12,000 left. More than 90% have gone. 12,000, and yet milk production isn't down that much. And you know why? Because cows are producing more milk, of course. Champion milk producer now lives over near Marathon, Wisconsin. It's a cow called Arrow Star Lynn. Produces 63,444 pounds of milk in a year. That's almost 32 tons. That's an awful lot of milk, he said. That's the direction that dairy farming is going now. Small herds are out. Nobody 
can make it on a small herd anymore. You get four or five hundred cows. That's what you do, hire six guys to milk them, and you sit inside at your computer, <laughs> and you work out deals on feed. That's how dairy farming of the future. That's what killed me, he said, corn, price of corn. Just got up too high, just couldn't make it anymore. All my milking equipment, the coolers, all that stuff, it's 20 years old, would have had to replace it. No bank was going to loan me money. I'm 66 years old, and I'm not sure I would have wanted to borrow it anyway, so I'm out of it. He raised his glass. Well, Lyle said, a lot of these kids in my class, they think they're going to become farmers, but they got another thing coming, I'll tell you. Not smart enough. Never be able to make it. I tell you, there's just no curiosity. There's no initiative in that class. Just the silliest, giggliest bunch of kids there. I was telling them today, I was telling them about sand cranes. And you got these species of cranes that look almost identical. The Florida crane and the Texas crane. Big, beautiful birds. But they take off. And they're genetically imprinted for two different destinations. And the Florida cranes fly directly over the city of Chicago and on down to Florida. And the Texas cranes fly off to the southwest and they fly over Grand Island, Nebraska and down to Rockport and Corpus Christi, Texas. This genetic imprint in their brain tells them when it's cold, go, and tells them exactly where to go? And I'm walking up and down the aisles in between the desks as I'm talking about them, and the kids are taking notes, and they've written Florida, Texas. That's it. No reaction. No questions. No curiosity whatsoever. Well, Clint said, I tell you, my mother still has a lot of curiosity at the age of 92. This last spring, she saw some big birds flying over her house down there, and Arizona, and she went out walking to try and find their nest. They found her about a mile away from home. She was out in the desert with her walker, <laughs> walking off toward the hills. She seemed a little bit confused about where she was. So the neighbors called me. I flew down there, back down. The next day, I flew down. I said, Mother, we've got to do something about this. And I got in a fight with my own mother, 92 years old. She sat there weeping. I was crying. One minute she'd say, I don't want to be a burden to anybody. And the next minute she'd say, you're just sitting around waiting for me to die. That's all you want. You just want to shovel me into an old folks home. That's all you want. It was hard, but I finally got her to agree that she would move out of that house. She'd move up to a senior complex up in Minneapolis and she'd do it in the fall so that she'd be all set by the time the snow flew. Well, Irene went down there about two weeks ago. And she's been there for two weeks, and Mother hasn't made a bit of progress in packing up her stuff. She's got 3,000 books. She doesn't want to get rid of a single one. She wants to pack them all up and bring them up to this one-room apartment. She's got four sets of china. She's got two sets of eight settings, and she's got two sets of 12, so she's got enough for 40 dinner guests. <laughs> And she doesn't want to give up a single one. She'll sit there and go through a box of old pictures. And she'll write on the backs of about 10 or 12 of them. And then she'll go lie down for a while. <laughs> Irene called me with a progress report the other night. She said, there's been no progress whatsoever. <laughs> I can't get her to do anything and to pack up. She won't. She put Mother on the phone. And Mother came on the phone. And she cupped her hand over the mouthpiece. And she said, Clint, Irene is down here. And she's trying to hornswoggle me out of one of my sets of china. <laughs> she's trying to get a set of china out of me. Why don't you people have the decency to wait until a woman is dead before you try to get her <laughs> things away from her? Boy, I tell you, Lyle said, I wish my kids had that much curiosity as your mother does going out on the desert to see those birds. They wouldn't walk across a room to see a bird. Have no interest in it whatsoever. He thought about that skinny girl that was in his biology class eight years ago, Annette. She couldn't learn enough. She read every book he gave her. Kid was just on fire. Every day she came to class, her eyes were shining. She's off at Duke now. She's in graduate school in microbiology. 
for kids like that, that's all you live for when you're a teacher. But there hasn't been anybody since. Like Annette, skinny little girl from a dusty little town in the Midwest, and she's off to do great things because something got lit inside her. Well, Raleigh said, I tell you, I've been working from 1945. Never had a day of vacation until about 15 years ago. Seven days a week, twice a day, milk those cows. Young people today, they don't do that. No, just 15 years ago, we went off to Seattle because I'd never seen the ocean. I wanted to have a look at it. Never a day of vacation. Young people now, they don't work like we work. They don't know what work is today. Lyle said, you know those birds? It's so amazing to think of them flying off to a place they've never even seen. It's all inside their brains going off someplace. Speaking of flying, Clint said, I may have to fly down to Arizona. <laughs> I may have to go in front of a probate court judge at a hearing, and in front of my own mother sitting right there in a the courtroom, I may have to say that she is mentally incompetent to manage her own affairs and have me declared her guardian. Boy, talk about hard work. I'm not looking forward to it if I have to go. These kids of mine, I tell you, Lyle said, farming would be the long, last thing they'd ever be able to do. Sit at a computer working out a cash flow diagram, they wouldn't know how to begin. It's changed completely. Said Raleigh, farming isn't what it used to be. Look at chickens, turkeys nowadays. Keep them in these big stainless steel dormitories and never even see the light of day. It's no wonder they taste the way they do. <laughs> got these cows that give 32 tons of milk a year. You got these 15 pound boar hogs with the testicles big as cantaloupe. I tell you, those people aren't farmers, they're zookeepers. I don't know what I'm going to do, Clint said. I guess I'm going to have to fly down to Arizona. <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see. Another beer and bump all around here. While he came, poured three more shot glasses full of Jim Beam, three glasses full of Wendy's beer. Raleigh started to cry. He said, some of those cows have been with me for a long time. Those are good guys, those cows, I tell you. Don't tell me about cows. I know about cows. That old bull of mine, he lays there in the shade, lays there next to his girlfriend. That gray cow, she's been his girlfriend now for years. Of course, when it comes to breeding, he mounts all of them. That's his business, but she's the one he's loyal to. He's been loyal to her all these years. It's touching to see them. I never forget. The time I slaughtered a cow right there by the barn, all the other cows were way off the far end of the pasture, and I slaughtered that cow. And by the time they came in in the evening, there was nothing left of that cow but just the head and the legs and the entrails. And those cows came over to the fence, and they started in bawling and wailing. They were crying. It was so beautiful. just tore at your heart to hear them. There was such grief. I tell you, you could do worse than spend your life with cows, I tell you. <laughs> and he reached for his glass of whiskey, and he just slid off the stool. <laughs> he just slid to the floor, and he sat there. And Lyle and Clint picked him up and carried him outside and put him in his car. And Lyle drove him home, and Clint drove his car behind to bring Lyle back. They drove out of town way out eight miles west of town to the Hochstetter's dairy farm. They lifted him out of the seat. He hadn't come to yet, and they carried him into the kitchen. And Agnes was there in the kitchen, the smell of meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green beans in this lovely kitchen, the linoleum floor, the oilcloth table, all set, bright light overhead. Agnes looked at Raleigh as they carried him in, a dead trooper, and she 
said, carry him back to the bedroom. She said, I'll take care of him later. Don't worry about him. Raleigh should not drink. He never had the practice. <laughs> they came back in the kitchen. She said, would you like some supper? Well, sure, they said, of course. <laughs> they sat down at the table and she filled up their plates. It was very good meatloaf, wonderful mashed potatoes and gravy and green beans. They ate it. Lyle said, so I understand that Raleigh's getting out of the dairy business. She said, nah. <laughs> he talks about it, but he's... <laughs> he's never going to do that. No, not Raleigh. No, she said. They drove on home, Clint and Lyle, the two of them in the dark. Lyle said, I always wondered if someday a guy would just come to that day and think, now this is the end. I can't go any farther. I thought today was kind of that day for me, but I don't know. Clint said, no. He said, I don't think a person ever comes to that point. He said, I think even when you're 92 years old, you still have big plans. Even when you come to the last day of your life, you still have big ideas. You're looking way, way down the line, is what I think. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average.